Hello, and welcome to Just Therapist Things, where we talk all things therapy. My name is Jordan, and I am an associate marriage and family therapist from Southern California. I currently work in a private practice where we focus on child anxiety reduction, and I also do some work for a nonprofit cancer support organization. Today, I will be speaking about something that affects us at any life stage, but especially when we are just starting out in our careers. Today, I will be speaking about imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is not a diagnosable mental health illness, but it is a way to describe the internalized state of feeling like a fraud or feeling incompetent. People who experience this often undermine their own skills or talents. Imposter syndrome is mostly used to describe feelings of incompetence in professional life, but it can also be used to describe feelings in other stages of life, such as with new parents. This is a fairly new term, and it was first used by psychologist Susanna Imez and Pauline Rose Clance in the 1970s. There is actually much more research on imposter syndrome in women, and it seems to affect more women than men. This is most likely because women had and still have to prove themselves in the working world. Women deal with inequality on a regular basis and often feel inferior to their male counterparts. This is especially prominent for people of the LGBTQIA community. People in this community have faced decades of discrimination in the workplace, among other places. Imposter syndrome also affects more people of racial, religious, and socioeconomic minorities for a similar reason. Those of a racial, religious, or socioeconomic minority who do quote-unquote make it can question their capabilities and adequacy. Individuals of minority populations may have been told their whole lives that they need to work harder and smarter to achieve what others obtain easily. Since minorities are underrepresented in the education system and in the workplace and are often discriminated against, it is likely that a feeling of imposter syndrome will affect them. Everyone, everyone experiences imposter syndrome. A study done in 2020 actually showed that 8 out of 10 people have experienced imposter syndrome. Even super high-achieving people, and actually more often high-achieving people, are hit with it. There is a quote from Paul McCartney, who is clearly so successful and incredible, but he says, you never think you're good. I really ought to think I'm fantastic because I have this pile of achievements, but I'm still going, oh, can I do it? So yeah, everyone experiences imposter syndrome. I mean, I even have imposter syndrome right now because I'm thinking, who wants to hear me talk? Why do I think people want to listen to what I have to say? For everyone who is experiencing imposter syndrome, unless you have lied, stolen, or cheated to get to where you are, it is likely that you are actually very worthy, competent, and deserving of your personal and professional successes. It is important to note that in this episode, when I use the words worthy or deserving, I do not mean entitlement. The only thing people are entitled to in this world are human rights. And there is always, unfortunately, that question of what characterizes a human right. However, no one is entitled to success. Success is earned, but there are also multiple factors that influence success. It is crucial to acknowledge that many factors that lead to success and failure, such as systemic discrimination, racism, sexism, privilege, and inequality, among other reasons. Success is also subjective and means something different to everyone. Your version of success can be drastically different than the person sitting next to you, and that is completely okay. Also, the term imposter syndrome is controversial in itself. Even the psychologists who founded the term are questioning its value. Much of the controversy revolves around the term in the context of capitalism and privilege. 
The Australian scholar Rebecca Harkins Cross says, capitalism needs us all to feel like imposters because feeling like an imposter ensures we'll strive for endless progress, work harder, make more money, try to be better than our former selves and the people around us. Find more on this quote in the piece by Anne Burry that I linked in the episode details. The piece by Leslie Jameson in my episode details eloquently discusses how people of color and of the LGBT community do not experience imposter syndrome because they simply experience, quote unquote, the external truths of privilege with being part of a marginalized community. I do strongly agree that to prevent and alter imposter syndrome completely, that only comes from system reform and confronting discrimination and privilege. While I discuss the individualized experience of imposter syndrome based on age, gender binaries, and personality primarily, please remember that there is so much more to explore about this term, and please, please read the pieces linked in the episode details. Imposter syndrome can hit at any age for many different reasons. However, it hits so hard in your 20s. When discussing this with a friend, she said, Your 20s are just one big imposter syndrome, especially in jobs and in grad school. There is a constant feeling of, how am I here? What am I doing? I'm not qualified. That is exactly it. You may have finished college and are joining the working world. You hear mixed messages of, your 20s are just for fun, do whatever you want, versus you need to plan for your future. Some of your friends may be getting married and having kids, while others are far from it. You can feel like a fraud and confused as to why people are treating you like you know what you're talking about. You are young, but you're also not that young. You need to start somewhere, but also don't know where to start. A friend in the professional world reflects this so well. She says, This age period is when you tend to start your first career type jobs, and it's hard to find a balance between I'm getting to know my company and position, so I have a lot to learn, versus, okay, I actually do know some stuff and and am an expert in these topics. As a young therapist, I definitely know my stuff, but I also get questioned constantly by prospective clients. I also get rejected by many clients due to my age or perceived lack of experience. The same can be said about an older therapist. While everyone has preferences and it is completely okay that clients have preferences for their therapist's age, it also fuels my imposter syndrome. Young age can be either seen as a lack of experience or having more relevant experience. It really depends. I am also lucky to be in a profession that is mostly woman-dominated. This does give me a sense of security when my age provides some insecurity. A friend who is a boss lady in her profession says, in industries that are often dominated by men, such as finance and tech, it's even harder not to experience imposter syndrome since you don't see a lot of women at said table. So you wonder, what makes you different? For me to see women founders or women VPs on panels at conferences instills confidence that I could eventually do a panel myself. This is a great example of how seeing others like you who are succeeding in their field can help you believe in yourself and negate the imposter feelings. Seek out those people and connect with them, or you can be the one to pave that pathway for the next person. As I said previously, imposter syndrome is not a diagnosable mental illness, but it can be accompanied by anxiety and depression. It is unlikely that you will have imposter syndrome and not have some semblance of anxiety or depression. Imposter syndrome can spark new anxiety and depressive symptoms or exacerbate new ones. There is a lot of overlap between anxiety, depression, and imposter syndrome, such as having low self-esteem or self-worth, inability to assess your own competency and skills, being super overwhelmed by tasks, experiencing self-doubt, and also having inhibited functioning. Imposter syndrome is extremely coexistent with generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, and perfectionism. If you have a tendency to think negatively, 
have insecure attachment styles, or have low self-esteem, imposter syndrome is more likely to affect you. Also, imposter syndrome greatly affects people who are high achieving or perfectionists. These people often feel like they need to uphold some sort of reputation or meet a standard. People who are high achieving can sometimes set unrealistic goals for themselves and then feel disappointed or feel like a failure when they do not meet these goals. Imposter syndrome is actually a barrier to doing well. It can serve as a sort of learned helplessness. Learned helplessness is when your brain is frequently met with adverse experiences or stimuli and learns to submit to powerlessness. With imposter syndrome, this can take the form of feeling insecure about your skills or performance, so your brain consciously or subconsciously does not try as hard or do as well. As you can probably guess, there's a lot of distorted thinking that comes with imposter syndrome. It typically manifests as negative self-talk, such as, I don't have the right to be here, or I don't know what I'm talking about, or there are others who are more professional and know more than me. The fact of the matter is, there will always be someone who is smarter, works harder, and is more confident than you. But that does not mean that your skills don't matter. Even if you are young or just starting out, you do have skills that make you desirable and that contribute to your personal goals, the company's successes, or the field's development. Another way that imposter syndrome presents is that you can't internalize your experiences of success even when you do well at something. Even when you do well, you still have the same negative thoughts and you don't believe that the success is based on your own merit. Some of the distorted thoughts, or as therapists call them, the cognitive distortions that arise from imposter syndrome are catastrophizing, focusing on the negative, mind reading, all or nothing thinking, and magnification or minimization. Catastrophizing is thinking of the worst possible situation, and it usually takes the form of the snowball effect, where if you think of a snowball rolling down a hill, it just keeps collecting snow and getting bigger and bigger. And it's the same with the distorted thought. The thought just keeps getting bigger and bigger. An example of this would be, what if I don't do well on this interview and then I'll never get a job and then I won't be able to pay rent or pay for food and then what if I die? Catastrophizing is a very common cognitive distortion. Another one that is very common is focusing on the negative. And that is what you may suspect focusing on the negative while discounting the positive. An example of this would be focusing on one critical comment from your boss and discounting all the other positive comments. Mind reading is when you believe that you know what another person is thinking. An example of this is that client thinks I'm dumb and don't know what I'm doing. So you make assumptions about what the other person is thinking about you and that may not be what they're thinking at all. Another distortion is all or nothing thinking, which uses words like always or never, and does not acknowledge that there could be a sometimes or a maybe possibility. An example of this is, I always make mistakes, or I never do anything right. Lastly, negative talk can take the form of magnification or minimization. Magnification is making something seem bigger than it really is, such as magnifying mistakes, and minimization is minimizing successes. So how do we cope with imposter syndrome? First off, start by acknowledging and challenging the negative thoughts. So point out those negative thoughts when they come up and then challenge them by using logical or realistic or rational thinking. Also, focus solely on your skills and your strengths and work on building yourself up and building that confidence. That, of course, is easier said than done, but if you fake it till you make it a bit and actively acknowledge your strengths and skills, your brain will build that neural pathway of confidence and you will eventually believe it. This is what I like to call a brain hack 
which I will talk about further in a future episode. In addition to building your own confidence, also think realistically about others. They are not superheroes. They are not gods and goddesses. They are people just like you. So when you humanize these people that you idolize a bit, you won't think that you are so inferior because you're not. Next, don't should yourself. Don't think, where should I be at this point in life? What should I be doing? How much should I be making? Just focus on where you are in the present moment. And know that you are not alone. Remember the statistic of 8 out of 10 people experience imposter syndrome? You are really not alone. And again, imposter syndrome can affect anyone at any stage of life. And although sucky, it is a normal part of being a human in this stressful, highly productive world. Lastly, don't be afraid to take a break. If you keep pushing yourself without recharging your own battery, that is not helpful to anyone. Taking a break is not being lazy or inefficient, but it is actually an investment in yourself and in your productivity. You can't pour from an empty bucket. Imposter syndrome is no fun, but it is very common. It is likely that your roommate, your partner, your friends, your family have all experienced it at some point, and everyone somehow gets through it. If you would like to learn more about imposter syndrome, visit the websites in the episode details. I hope you found this episode useful, and thank you for listening to Just Therapist Things. I will talk to you soon.